going to talk about sound and go over some of the basic characteristics of sound today. And uh, basically, I want you to know uh, that sound is a longitudinal wave, uh, that it, it has a fairly constant speed here at near, uh, we're near sea level. And where we are, the sound is about 343 meters per second. You know, I'll write that down later. And that sound, that speed can vary a little bit, but not very much. Um, if, it, if it's a cold, dry day, the air is a little denser. So the speed of sound is a little fan, uh, faster. If it's a warm, really hot, muggy day, it's a little bit slower. Not much, uh, but a little bit. But we're just going to say, on average, near sea level, 343 meters per second. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, that. Um, we're also going to talk about uh, this thing called a Doppler shift. Have you heard of Doppler shift? How many of you ever watched uh, like NASCAR or a, 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 um, a race, car race on, on television? And they always have a camera down on the, on the track, right? And you see the cars going by. What kind of sound do they make when they go by? right just like that that's not the sound my Tesla makes yeah my Tesla goes quiet stealthy zero emissions all right and yet just as fast all right Okay. You know you're jealous. All right. Um, oh, come on. I just wanted to focus it. All right, sound. So let's review a little bit, though. Um, uh, we're going to let, let's review. Uh, so we're, we're going to um, talk about uh, what if I had a rope? Now, um, I'm going to get a rope or a sprig or something. I used, I used to have one. I couldn't find it this morning. So we'll just have to use our imagination. So you have somebody holding a rope here, somebody holding a rope here, and then the person on this side starts waving it up and down. So they go up and down like this. So what kind of, what, what kind of waves do we see in the rope? Well, we see the, the rope go up and down, and up and down, or something like this. And it just keeps going. Uh, we'll talk about standing waves a little bit later. But now, um, and the waves move this way. So here's our speed of our waves moving through the material. And no whistling. Uh, and so, it, it, now look, look at what we've done here. This is what defines what we call a transverse wave. Uh, and that is to make, to disturb the material, to put energy into the material. That's what a wave is. I'm going to put energy into a material. That energy is going to go through the material and transfer from one place to another. But the material isn't really going to change where it is. I mean, it might get disturbed back and forth. But when it's all done, the rope just stays where it is. So the, well, the direction of the speed of the wave of the velocity of the wave is to the right. But how did I disturb the material? By moving the, per the material up and down perpendicular to the motion of the wave. So the wave is moving to the right, but to make the wave, I had to go like this. Okay, just like this. And look at them, just move across the paper. Well, no, wait. No, that doesn't, that's pretty stupid. All right, stopping. Now, the distance of maximum displacement, we call this the amplitude. And the amplitude is from here in the middle out to the maximum. So this is the amplitude from here, you know, so the amplitude will be the same on both sides um, away from the equilibrium position of the rope or the slinky or whatever I'm, I'm putting a wave into. Now, the wave has what we call, what does that stand for? It's wavelength. 
it's how long one how far one complete wave goes so this thing was over here and then you wait and then now it's over here and we it's gone it starts repeating its motion the distance it, it goes so it's the length of one complete wave and it doesn't matter what you pick I can start here and the next time I go up which is right here so the wavelength is from here over to here which is the same as from here over to here so it's just the length of one complete oscillation the length of one wave does that make sense okay all right now um, one of the the aspects of this wave is that um, it has a frequency like how many times do I wiggle it up and down per second that's called frequency F is for frequency it's the number of cycles or complete waves I make per second and a cycle per second is abbreviated HZ HZ stands for Hertz so when you hear a radio station on uh, 95.7 megahertz that's 90 95 million uh, 700,000 cycles per second for that radio station well those are radio waves that's not if you don't don't try to make 95 million waves per second with a rope you'll really hurt yourself um, now the speed of the wave is related to the frequency how many waves I make every second uh, times how long the wave is that gives you uh, how fast the wave moves so the speed is equal to frequency times wavelength now this makes total sense frequency is in cycles or waves per second and wavelength is the length in meters for each wave or each cycle it's the length of each cycle from here to here is one cycle okay. so well they don't really cancel because they're just counting numbers but so you end up with meters per second which is speed so there's this is the speed of the wave so this is used quite often um, remember the period is equal to one over the frequency um, so uh, the period uh, so sometimes you'll see this velocity equals um, the wavelength divided by the period you'll see it written like that and this is meters per second makes sense if you look at it in terms of units it's easy to remember okay and this makes sense too in terms of units this is one over cycles per second right well you reciprocate that you get seconds per cycle and that's what period is how many seconds you have in one cycle of the material okay then we had these things called uh, longitudinal waves Now, um, it's pretty easy to see with the slinky, even on the dot cam. Uh, I'm going to, here, if I want to make a longitudinal wave, I, I move it back and forth like this. And that sends little compressions and rarefactions in the slinky. It's really easy to see with the slinky. I wish I had more of them. So let's do it. So you get an area squished in, spread out, squished in, spread out, squished in, spread out, squished in, and so on. Now these waves are moving to the right. Uh, but the way I make the wave, the disturbance I make in the material to make this wave is like this. Back and forth. So I'm going to go ooh, 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 like this. And it makes these waves go through it. Now, it has amplitude. This is the amplitude right here. 
the distance, I, I move it from the equilibrium position to the maximum displacement. So it's going to... So if I were to, uh, if I was a little ant, and I was uh, sitting on the, on the slinky, my position would go like that, just, would, would just go back, back and forth like that. Whereas if I was in a transverse wave and I was a little ant, I would go up and down, up and down. But this goes back and forth, back and forth. Oops, it's off screen when I did that. So a little ant right here, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Doesn't matter where. And then over here, it's back and forth, back and forth. Difference between a longitudinal and a transverse wave. But all the other stuff is the same. From the middle of a compression to the middle of a compression, that's the wavelength. And of course, the frequency is just how many complete oscillations I make per second. And the speed is equal to frequency times wavelength. And the period is 1 over the frequency, etc., etc. Well, let's take a look at sound waves. Oops, not sound waves. Sound waves. Well, one easy way to, um, wait a minute. What do I do with the tuning forks that I had out? I had some good ones out that, oh, great. Stupid. All right. Um, I think I got some out that were really good, and then I threw them back in here because I'm. Because I had two that uh, gave me a really good beat frequency. I'll have to try again. I'll find them. But anyway. Huh. Oh, I put them over there. Okay. Um, so here's a tuning fork. <laughs> and uh, musicians uh, used to use these to tune guitars and stuff before we had electronic tuners. Have any guitar players in here? Okay, if you guitar player, when I was playing the guitar, um, I would get an E an E tuning fork right here, and I would tune my top string to this, and then I would tune all the other strings in the car uh, guitar to to that first string. So you could do it with just one tuning fork, because I couldn't if I was too poor for an electronic tuner. I think we all were. I don't know. Maybe they had them. I don't know. It was, long. It was the late 70s. I don't know. Um, now, so if you have a tuning fork and you smack it, well, I don't know if you can see it, but it's kind of blurry. You see it's kind of, let's see if I can put it up against the, this is kind of blurry. So there it is. And then I strike it. Now, why is it blurry like this? Well, watch here. I'm going to. What? So, it's it's vibrating back and forth. Not funny. All right, uh, it's vibrating back and forth like this. Ooh. Only this is really slow. All right. Um, so, so it goes back and forth. Now I think what I'll do is I'll just do one time of this tuning fork. I'll just trace it right here. Now, don't be gone last time, uh, next class period, because we're going to do fun with forks, and it's really, really is fun, fun little lab. Now, this, so when I put this thing in motion, it goes back and forth like this, back and forth, back and forth. Now, how many times per second does it go back and forth? In other words, what's the frequency? Well, it's printed right here, 288 hertz. And now. That may or may not be accurate, but that's what the manufacturer has told us. And they're pretty accurate. They're within two or three hertz of being that value. Um, then, and then what does it do? Well, what are we surrounded by? We're surrounded by air. And so, 
uh, it, 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 when it goes back and forth like this, it smacks into the air. Well, what does that do? That creates a compression. An area, oh, and I forgot to mention that when longitudinal waves, this is high pressure, or it's been squished in. High pressure, uh, we call it a compression. And this right here is low pressure air. Well, this is a slinky, but in a slinky, it's, if it's spread out, um, when air, it's when the air has been spread out, low pressure, and it's called a rarefaction. A rarefaction, not a rare fraction. A rarefaction. It's just where the air is rarefied, or a little like a little bit of a vacuum. So when this tine squishes into the air, it pushes the air closer together. Now I'm going to draw it as little dots. Each of these represents an air molecule. Of course, there are trillions of air molecules, but I don't have time to draw trillions of air molecules. Then, uh, when the when the tuning fork now it's going to smack into that that high pressure air, and that that high pressure wave is going to move. And then, but then when it goes backwards, it creates uh, rarefaction so the air is more spread out so it's rarefied and then uh, now here's the previous uh, compression and then here's the previous rarefaction so you can kind of see it look kind of looks like the slinky and then here's the compression Again. And then here's a rarefaction, and so on. Now, if you were to follow one little air molecule, the air molecule is not moving from here over to here. That's called wind. Okay, if 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 you have air molecules all moving together across uh, you, you know the, the, the space that would be air flowing together that's wind um, but I am speaking to you now I'm not blowing in your ear I'm speaking out loud yeah okay don't get creeped out How, um, the air molecules doing this let's take a look at one little air molecule uh, how about this one? What is it doing? It's moving back and forth like this. It's going ee, 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 in such a way that um, that they'll move so that these guys are compressed and these guys are a little farther apart. And this might be a, even a little exaggerated how, how what the difference in pressure is between here and here. Now, when I'm speaking to you now with sound, I'm making compressions and rarefactions in the air, and they hit your eardrum, and they physically move your eardrum. Little tiny forces through little tiny distances means I'm doing a little tiny bit of work on your eardrums right now. And your eardrum goes back and forth to match the frequency of the sound that's hitting it. That gets translated through three little bones, which hits a cochlea, which vibrates a fluid, which tickles these little hairs, which stimulates these little nerves, and they go to the brain, and it works for almost everybody. It is a miracle. It is amazing. If I was going to go into medicine, that would be, I'd want to be your ear, nose, and throat doctor. There's a fancier name. I can't remember what it is, but um, but it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty cool. All right. So sound is a longitudinal wave. Now let's talk about the medium. Sound can travel through a gas, like it's doing right now. The, the, the air in this room is a gas. But it can also travel through water or a liquid, or it can travel through a solid, a, a solid material, like an earthquake. Earthquakes like seismic waves, 
It's like it's kind of like sound moving through the material. Um, the uh, in fact, the denser the material, the faster the speed of sound. Went on screen. Yeah, the denser. Center my paper here. The denser the material. the faster the speed of sound. Now, in air, we're going to say the speed of sound is equal to 343 meters per second. That's kind of the accepted value for sound. But, if it's a cold, very cold, dry day, um, the air is a little denser, and it might be 345 or 346 meters per second. It'd be a little bit faster. If it's a really hot, muggy day, the, the air molecules on average are a little farther apart, so it takes more time for them to smash into each other to create a longitudinal wave, and it might be 300, 340 meters per second or something like that. So it varies a little bit. You go up in altitude, the higher you go, the slower the speed of sound. Okay, because the air molecules are farther and farther apart, less dense. Now water, really dense stuff. And sound travels really well through water. And and, and whales and, and other and fish and you know are really well adapted for that. And whales, uh, like humpback whales, they can sing to each other and they can communicate across hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles across oceans because the sound travels so well through water. Now there is a sad part of this. We humans, um, with our ships, are making a huge amount of sound in the ocean. And so the poor whales are living in just really a loud ocean right now. So that's why I think we should put Teslas and we should replace all those loud ships with Teslas. Someday. Someday Tesla will make cargo ships. and so Well, they would be a lot quieter. Um, but, uh, but think about it. I mean, these poor whales are just living in constant sound all the time. They've got human-caused tinnitus. It's really nasty. Um, anyway, the more dense material, fast the speed of sound. And you've got compressions and refractions and all that. Now, there's a couple of really cool um, properties of sound that I want you to know. Uh, the first one is uh, the Doppler shift. And you've all experienced the Doppler shift. If you've um, seen a car um, go uh, honking its horn as it passes you, It'll, right, you've heard that. Um, I, 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 you can really hear it with, um, let's see, Doppler, my screen, yeah, Doppler <coughs> shift. Now, there are equations that describe Doppler shift, but I don't think for the purposes of this class, you're going to need to know those. You just need to understand Doppler shift conceptually. So let's suppose. You have a car, and it's not a Tesla, unfortunately, but um, it's just sitting right there. And here we have a listener just standing here on the street. And they've got ears, and they're listening. Now let's say this thing is just sitting there. The car, the velocity of the car is zero. It's just sitting there, and the guy starts revving the engine. You know, it's just one of these muscle cars, right? And so it's creating a lot of sound. And the sound is radiating evenly out into space, all around it. Now, if you had a listener on either side, I'm not drawing this very well, but if someone was behind the car or in front of the car, they would, it would sound the same. Maybe it would be like, uh, it, would, 
It would sound like that. But what if the car was moving really fast? Like 100 miles an hour. Doesn't have to be that fast, actually, but. So here's our listener standing in the middle of the road. Hope they get out of the way in time. Um, well, now what's happening is that the car is going to be moving in this direction. But the speed of sound in air uh, is going to be the same. See, these, these are compressions, and they're moving at 343 meters per second. But now the car is moving towards it. So what happens is that the compressions in front of the car get spread out. I mean, I mean the compressions get squished together in front of the car. And in back of the car, they get, uh, there's more, more distance. So the, the, the motion of the car is squishing in the sound waves. So let's draw these. Should have drawn the person a little closer to the car. So now the sound is hitting the person, the listener. But the wave, so velocity of sound equals frequency times wavelength, right? But look at the waves here. The waves here are closer together because the car is moving towards the listener and it's squishing in those waves. And so, but they're, they're going by with the same speed, but now they're closer together. So by, if you're over here, the wavelength is gonna be shorter, which means you're gonna hear a higher frequency because when you multiply these two together, they have to equal the speed of sound. So if this, this listener with the car motionless might hear, uh, but this person as the car approaches is going to hear uh, higher frequency. The higher frequency because the wavelength is shorter, because you have, but you have the same speed. Does that make sense? No? But the listener behind the car, here the waves are spread out. The wavelength is longer, so the frequency is going to be lower, and it's going to sound lower. So for this listener, as the car goes away, it's going to sound, uh, uh. so this person hears, uh, this person hears, uh, and this person hears, uh. So, but if you're one listener and you're this guy and the car goes by you, you're this It shifts from being at a higher than it should be frequency to what it should be frequency to a lower frequency as it drives by you. And you're this And you can really hear it when you watch uh, like a, a car racing on television because they put us they put a, a microphone right down there on the track, and the cars go by, and you hear this, yum, 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 yum. But you hear it too, just not quite as pronounced. If you're on a two-lane road, and you're going like 50, 60 miles an hour, and the cars pass you, when they go going the other way, you hear this, shoo, shoo, you, you, you. you definitely hear a shift in the pitch from high frequency to low frequency, to a lower like you, you, you. Um, and that's the Doppler shift. And not only sound does it, but light does it too. And this is how we can tell how fast galaxies are coming towards, or stars are coming towards us or away from us. By how much their light is shifted uh, towards us, we call that a blue shift, or away from us, longer wavelength, which is a red shift. And we're very, it's very, very precise. So Doppler shift, you're gonna get, you're probably gonna see a, two or three questions, maybe a couple questions on it on the AP test. And it's a pretty easy concept, I think, to understand. I don't think there'll be much math on it, but there'll be some conceptual type questions. 
Next thing I want to talk about are beat frequencies. Uh, I'm going to show you, a, I'm going to demonstrate this to you um, uh, more precisely in the Fun with Forks lab that we're going to do. But um, what I want to show you is this. These two tuning forks, they're both A notes, and they both say that they vibrate with 426.7 cycles per second. And let's 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 see. Let's let's try it out. I'm going to strike one of these and we'll hear it. We're actually going to hear a higher pitched harmonic mostly, but and Let's try this one. Is it the same? Sounds the same, doesn't it? They're slightly off because I tested this ahead of time, unlike last period. <laughs> All right, listen very carefully. This is really amazing. You hear that wah wah? You hear the wah wah frequency? I don't know why they call it the beat frequency. I think it should be called the wah wah frequency. <coughs> but again, they don't listen to me enough. All right. Why is it getting louder and quieter and louder and quieter? I mean, if I just hit one of them, it doesn't do that. Right. Just hit one of them, it doesn't do that. Hit two of them. It's because of superposition of sound of waves. Waves can add up to sound louder or subtract to sound quieter. And so what's happening is that the frequency of this tuning fork is slightly different than the frequency of this. So these printed out values, are, one of them's a little off, or maybe they're both a little bit off, but they're slightly different from each other. Like it was going, woo, 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 woo. so that's about I don't know one hertz, maybe a little less. So one of these might be five, five hundred twenty-six, and the other one might be five hundred twenty-seven. So they're off slightly. So the beat frequency, F sub B, is equal to one tuning fork minus the other tuning fork. But you take the absolute value. You don't really know which one's higher or lower just by listening to the two of them. You just know one of them is higher in frequency than the other one by by the amount of the beat frequency. And um, well, that's really good. So um, and you can use beat frequencies to tune a guitar. Um, uh, and uh, how, how many of you have ever tuned a guitar or a musical instrument and you know you pluck one string you pluck the other and you get this whoa, whoa, whoa. and what you want to do is you want to eliminate that if you if you bring the free, the, the two uh, guitar strings together so that the two guitar strings plucked together have exactly the same frequency what's the beat frequency going to be it's going to be zero you won't have a beat frequency so you can use beat frequencies to tune guitar strings to the same frequency. I mean, that's what I did. I would tune one string and then another, as I got close, I would hear a beat frequency. And so I would change it and change it until there was no beat frequency at all. And um, so, all right. Um, I think that's all I'm gonna cover with sound. Um, just remember, sound is a longitudinal wave it's compression and rarefaction of air molecules the air molecules don't move with the wave 
they just use the particles of the wave as the medium that they go through. There's a lot of great animations online. We'll find some. I'm just not going to make them part of this video. Um, you can have this thing called Doppler shift. If the source of sound is coming towards you, you're squishing in the air uh, or squishing in the waves. The waves uh, appear to be closer together. You get a higher uh, pitch. Uh, if the source of the sound is moving away from you, stretches out the sound waves, you have a longer wavelength. Therefore, you have a uh, lower pitch because it's the product of frequency times wavelength that gives us the speed of sound. The speed of sound uh, doesn't vary based on the source. Oh, one thing. What if our object was going at the speed of sound? What would happen? Well, all of the compressions would build up. So let's say here's the source of our sound. Maybe it's a jet. And the jet is making a lot of noise, but the, 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 the sound waves are trying to get away. But look at them build up right here in front of the jet. I think I'm drawing, I'm drawing, I'm doing okay with this. And so, like, if this is the tip of a jet, maybe here's a jet flying. Here's the wing. It's like a supersonic jet. You get this area of extremely high pressure air because it's one compression buildup on the edge. So squishing that air in really, really. And what, it, what you come off in a three dimension, I can only draw in two dimensions, but you get what's called a shock wave. And have you ever heard of sonic boom? That's this, this shock, this, this, built up wave and if you're on the ground right here let's say you're standing right here below the jet when that sound wave comes comes past you you hear this big boom and uh now and it's it's nasty if you're really close to that jet uh it can rupture your eardrums it can be bad um in war uh Jets, like in, in the Afghanistan war when the Soviet Union was in there, in the Vietnam war, I know uh, Americans did this with their uh, F-4 uh, Phantom jets. They would fly. I talked to a pilot. He said, yeah, we did this. It was, you know, if they're in, they're in the jungle and there's, there's people, there's, you know, soldiers uh, there uh, that are, you know, trying to kill your soldiers. So what would they would do? Because these guys were all hidden by all this, this, uh, uh, jungles they would fly right over the jungle going at a supersonic speed and this shock wave would cause the you know would, would hurt the people underneath it it's terrible uh, terrible thing this is why we don't allow um, supersonic flights um, in and out of airports with supersonic transports because the shock waves you know would really be disruptive to cities so, like when we used to have the the uh, the Concorde would fly between New York and London, uh, it wasn't allowed to fly supersonic over land. It could only fly supersonic over um, over the ocean, where there's not, not many. So the shock wave can't hurt. Now, if you're far enough away, the shock wave is just annoying. It's not damaging because it gets obviously it gets less intense as you get farther away. There are plans to build uh, supersonic uh, planes that are designed to try to dampen the shock and make it less uh, uh, loud and so on. Anyway, we went a little beyond where we needed to. Any questions? That is... That's right. That's all.